Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a main highlight of today's Technology Day. I'm Charlene Cavsonell, a Class of 79 alumna in Course 6 and President of the MIT Alumni Association. Right now, I have the privilege of introducing MIT President L. Raphael Reif. A true citizen of MIT, Raphael joined the Institute in 1980 as a faculty member in EECS and has served in a variety of leadership roles at the Institute, including a term as Provost from 2005 to 2012 before becoming the 17th president of MIT. A champion for both fundamental science and MIT's signature style of interdisciplinary problem-centered research, he is a tenacious advocate for accelerating innovation and embracing the world's toughest challenges. During the next hour, Raphael will be sharing his perspectives on the MIT of today and keeping with our Technology Day theme of Pathways to the Future the continued role that the Institute will play in making a better world. To that end, in May, Raphael announced the Institute's visionary approach to the greatest existential threat facing humankind right now with the launch of Fast Forward, MIT's climate action plan for the next decade. You'll be hearing more about this Earthshot later today during the Tech Day main stage event, but I know that he's excited to share more about this shortly. Engaging President Reif in today's discussion is Song Yi Yoon, a Quartz 9 alumna who received her PhD from MIT in 2000. A member of the MIT Corporation, Song Yi is the President and Chief Global Strategy Officer for NCSoft, a global digital entertainment company and one of the leading video game publishers. Song Yi was instrumental in the establishment of the company and recently in the foundation of the NCSoft AI and Natural Language Processing Centers, advanced AI research facilities within NCSoft created to help further the company's use of AI and machine learning technology. Song Yi was also the architect behind the introduction of the Intelligent and Personalized Data Services Platform, as well as the Intelligent Data Services over mobile platforms for SK Telecom, the largest wireless service provider in South Korea. Among many leadership roles, Song Yi also served on the Presidential Advisory Council for Science and Technology for South Korea's 16th President, No Mu Hyung, and the 15th President, Kim Dae Jun. Thank you, Song Yi, for joining us, and thank you again, Raphael, for being here today. I know I joined the thousands tuning in right now in excitement over what we'll learn from your conversation today. And now I turn it over to you, Song Yi. Thank you, Charlene, for the kindest introduction. Good morning, um, a good afternoon, President Reif. It is so wonderful to see you on the Zoom, although it would, it would have been better to see you in person. And thank you so much for taking your time to speak with us alumni today. Thank you, Songyi, and, and, and warm greetings to all our alumni and friends watching us right now. And so before we start, I would like to make a brief announcement that is very meaningful to me. I recently learned that this year's reunion classes contributed a truly unbelievable $151 million from more than 3,300 reunion donors. And that is an unbelievable number uh, many of those donors, I'm, I'm sure, watching us right now, I want to tell you and to say to all of you, thank you so very much for your support and for the confidence you have on all of us. Uh, uh, MIT truly deserves what you're doing for us, so thank you. Back to you, Sonia. That's great. Thank you. Let's start with the reflection of this year. This, this has been a year like no other for all of us. And as someone responsible for reading a university through so many challenges, you have a unique vantage point. What are some of the things about MIT that have impressed you the most in this unprecedented time? 
Thank you. Thank you for that really wonderful question because it shouldn't have impressed me, but it did. To me, the most impress, impressed experience that I had is thanks to the people of MIT, uh, the students, the faculty, the staff. It was truly unbelievable. Um, the students were mature, were disciplined, they recognized and, and, and really responded, uh, understood the public health risk. Uh, they, they respected the, the protocols we had to have in place on social distancing and, and masks and all that. The students were really, truly, sincerely helpful and mature. The faculty, um, they, they did a labor of love. They, they transformed everything they were doing, the mind and hand on campus to mind and hand remotely. They did an, a, an incredible job giving a very, very good quality experience to our students studying from uh, away from campus. Uh, and it was really, the dedication was truly inspiring. Uh, it was much harder for them if anyone uh, talked to any of them to tell you that, that preparing an online lecture um, took much more time than preparing a live lecture. Um, and then the most, you expect that from students, you expect that from faculty, although I was truly impressed. You also expect that from staff, but what I saw in staff was extremely touching and moving. Uh, they, they, were, they were completely committed. They, they worked very long hours, they had no breaks. As you know, we had no races last year, except for those who made under $75,000. It didn't matter. They were completely committed to, to, to the Institute, to our mission, to our students. The people of MIT just rise to a level that to me was extremely inspiring. And, and, um, and uh, that's something that was MIT at its best. So what impressed me the most, what shouldn't have impressed me, what impressed me was how the people of MIT just worked together uh, to, to do such a terrific job uh, during such a difficult time. Yeah, that's right. As a community, MIT responded so quickly to the first warnings about COVID and took the necessary steps needed uh, to keep the community safe. And as I saw it unfolded, uh, I was so grateful for your leadership and your decisiveness and actions that you took was like solving a multivariable optimization problem itself to work on logistics of on-site and off-site research and contact tracing, et cetera. But what's really amazing is that how quickly you realized the pandemic would be a transformative event and launched a commission to imagine to rebuild the process, which is um, called Task Force 2021 in the midst of all. Can you share with us some of the ideas that came out of the task force? Yes, Sonja, I loved your description of a multivariable <laughs> problem because it was, there was so much going on at the same time that we had to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, optimize. And thank goodness we have expert optimization on our campus that were helping us deal with all that. Uh, well, I think, I think it was obvious to us from the very beginning to me that, that things will never be the same, but I did not know exactly in what way. So, so, so I just wanted, uh, while many of us were so focused on, on managing the pandemic, I wanted many of us also uh, complementarily involved in, in what's gonna happen next. So, so everybody could just be part of the future and the solution. Uh, so yeah, right now, at best I can tell uh, with my most recent update, there are more than 50 ideas that are converging right now. The task force is finalizing which of those to really recommend and how. Uh, and so those ideas are just about on everything, on, on how we work, how we teach, how we learn. Uh, and, and, and I don't want to jump ahead of what they're gonna coming up recommending at the end, but I can tell you a, a couple of quick observations that our students learned that uh, although online is not the same as live uh, lectures in person, there are many advantages of online and they basically, they are asking us and the task force is, is trying to figure out how to implement that, how to bring the best of online to the campus. So to give you an example, uh, universally the students love the chat feature of, of, of Zoom. And that's because 
uh, when the class is going on, a student sometimes feels a little bit uncomfortable raising their hand in class and stopping the class for a question. Uh, and they may feel maybe they are the only ones who couldn't understand it, so they don't want to raise their hand. Uh, in chat, they just simply write, I missed something, I don't understand this. And there is always a TA or some other uh, instructor answering the question so that the student gets the answer and gets back to the flow of the, of the lecture. And they love that. Although they love the in-person, in-life uh, you know, in -life lectures, uh, they also enjoy the fact that, that it's, pre it's, record not pre it's recorded, so they can go afterwards and lo look at it again to see what they could understand very well. So there are some features like that that they would like us to implement on campus. And those are examples of what we're trying to figure out. The other point that is interesting, and, and I'm, I'm waiting to see what the task force will recommend on this, is that if you think about it for a moment, Last year, the last since March of last of, of last year until now, MIT basically was a worldwide university, in the sense that we had students registered to get a bachelor's or master's or PhD degrees, mostly undergraduates by, uh, by and large, uh, all over the world taking classes from us, whether they were in India or or in Europe or all over the world. So, so. What does that mean when, when we were forced to do things that way and they worked? So what kind of opportunities or challenges that, that opens up for us? So the, I know there are ideas coming up and I have a sense of what those ideas are. They are not finalized for me. 50 ideas are still too many. I'm trying to narrow them down to what's most important. But the flavor of it is kind of what I just said right now. And, and I can see quite a few uh, very, um, uh, a practical, pragmatic, and, and ideas that in implementing will make MIT stronger and better. Right. That's so interesting. And I think I can imagine that it will lead to uh, different expectations in terms of the professors and teachers who are preparing for the curriculum and the content of the education because it can be replayed and can be watched from uh, far from the campus. and. Um, and the combination of hands-on education versus uh, remote education, asynchronous delivery will lead to um, expectation of the different skill sets and kind of bring different type of effort in creating those curriculums. Correct. Do you imagine that university kind of in the future requiring different set of skill sets in um, implementing those, those educations and, and delivering content? Well, I think that is a very good point. Uh, but the way I view it is that, um, yes, we will require a different set of skills to deliver the education, but I view it more from the point of view of the student. Um, students learn in very different ways. Uh, uh, you know, the kind of student that I was, uh, for example, um, I was the kind of student that would sit in a class, a lecturer would say something, and after five or 10 minutes, uh, he or she would say something that I found fascinating. And I went out the window flying with my imagination about what the instructor said. And by the time I get back, I don't know where that person is anymore. So, so there are people like me, there are others who, who can uh, uh, zoom <laughs> literally on, on the message the lecturer is conveying and doesn't, doesn't get distracted at all. So, so my point is for students like me, uh, a combination or ways to just see their lecture several times would be more attractive than, than for other kind of students that they don't need to see the lecture more than once. My point is that what really is coming is a, a better understanding uh, that we need to figure out how to reach to learners who learn differently. And, and we have a, a, we identify how fast you learn with how intelligent you are or how successful you will be after you learn. And the fact of the matter is that what matters is that you learn. Uh, if you learn faster or slower, and that depends on the style of, of uh, content delivery, uh, it matters less than how you use it afterwards. So, so that kind of focusing less on, on whether you can get it faster in a classroom in real time and focusing more on how you use what you learn, no matter how fast you learn it. All those are new ways of pedagogy that are being uh, unearthed by, by the forced experiment we had last year. Right, yeah, that's fantastic. I'm 
And universities are often uh, criticized as being the most conservative uh, institute organization on earth, but I'm really excited to see that MIT is embracing the changes and development of new technology and explore the new potential that it can have in, um, in education and bringing out the, the true potential of our students. Thank and speaking you. of the future, I know that MIT also recently put out a new climate plan and I'm sure that audience would like to hear about it. How do you understand the climate challenge and how is, how is the Institute approaching it? Yeah, thank you for asking that question, Songyi. I, I honestly think that that's the most serious existential challenge that we're facing right now. Uh, that, uh, and, and that we just have to recognize and figure out ways to contribute. So uh, the, the, at the high level, the highest level picture is that as a society and not just the United States, but the whole world, we really have to get uh, to a net zero emission economy by 2050. We have to get there. Um, and, and MIT has to figure out the role we want to play to contribute for society, for the world to get there. That's number one. Number two, we also have to recognize how we may be a little late on trying to get there, although I think there is still hope that if we work together, we can get there. But we have to also figure out how to adapt uh, if we cannot mitigate how to adapt to the consequence of climate change in, in particular parts of the world in which we're going to have to learn how to adapt. Uh, so that's a second important issue. And the third issue is in this 30-year race to address this challenge, um, we need to really educate the next generations of graduates of MIT and other places. Uh, to be able to handle this because it's a serious challenge that they are inheriting from our generations. And, uh, and we need to equip them to the tools to figure out how to address this challenge. So that's the high level view. In a more pragmatic view, I see two tracks of implementation. One is we have to do as much as we can, as fast as we can with the technology and the knowledge we have today. And we know plenty today, uh, and we, we, we can apply the renewables that we are aware of, whether it's solar, whether it's wind, we, we, or the clean, uh, the clean ones like nuclear. We have to figure out how to apply what we have today uh, to move as fast as possible to that the goal that I just identified. Um, and that means uh, infrastructure uh, to be able to adapt this new technology very quickly. That means policy incentives. We just have to do all of the above, uh, behavioral, uh, all of the above to move as fast as possible. However, if we just do that, if we just uh, 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 optimize the knowledge we have today, we will not get to zero, net zero emissions by 2050. We need much more. So track one is to move as fast as we can with what we know. Track two is invest and create the technologies that we will need to get to net zero emission in 2050. These two tracks ought to happen simultaneously. So at MIT, the track one, the idea of doing as much as you can with what we know. Uh, for that, one, one example of what we created is, that, is the MIT uh, Climate and Sustainability Consortium, which is a group of companies that are gonna be working with us because they want to uh, decarbonize, they lower, the, to reduce the carbon footprint of their production, of their operations, of their supply chains. And they wanna work with that to make that happen. And that, those are companies from completely different uh, sectors of the economy that want to work together and with us to get to that goal. So that's one example of working with companies that are driving the economy in different sectors to do as much as we can with the knowledge we have today. On track two, which is come up with the knowledge of the future, the technology of the future, we have the climate grand challenges. And that is a fantastic way to get our community to come up with the most important solutions we need for the most serious challenges. And the, and the community is responding. We have like a hundred of those terrific ideas and we're narrowing them down to which ones we're gonna be able to invest uh, uh, to address that track two issue. So, uh, that's that's the way we see it at a very high level. 
And, um, and goodness gracious, I think the plan is terrific in my view. Uh, it's a plan in which many people contribute at MIT. The challenge we have right now is really to get the funding to make sure that what we're saying happens. We're gonna, well, the companies are gonna be supporting the, 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 the track one approach or working with them. The track two approach, and that's the hardest thing they, to invest in inventing the new technologies. We need funding for that. Uh, hopefully the federal government will help, but we need much more than that. We need philanthropy and we're gonna be focusing on that in the very near future. Right, yeah. That's, that, that certainly is the most pressing problem of our generation. And I have a question about um, the, uh, the sense of the urgency. Like while we, a lot of people believe that it's extensive a challenge for our humankind, um, there are still some uh, people who deny the climate change. It's kind of the course of the, the, uh, the uh, the nature and history of the, the earth. Uh, and I think there are certain different degrees of uh, awareness in terms of urgency of, of the issue. What do you think is a role of a college or university that we can do offer to society to bring their um, the perspectives together so that we can all collaborate? It's an excellent, excellent question. I, I think our role is to try to translate what science is telling us uh, to explain it to the general public. I think uh, uh, we, we still have work to do on explaining science to the general public. Uh, there are many of them that I certainly understand it, but many of them that are not. And we have the problem right now with COVID. I mean, I think uh, uh, unless we convince people uh, to allow them to be vaccinated, we won't really be able to get rid of COVID globally. I mean, we may be able to do it in some countries or in some states, but in some others in which they don't want to get the vaccine. And, 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 and unfortunately, in some countries that want to get it still are not able to get it. That's a different issue. Uh, but, but my point is the, the lack of understanding of the importance of science and, and what science is really telling us that's gonna happen. When science tells you that we're gonna have a crisis in 30 years, unless we move rapidly, 30 years sounds like a long time away and it's not a crisis that's gonna happen abruptly, it's happening gradually, so we're already living it. But it's hard for people to comprehend that our job as educators is not only to educate the students we have on our campuses, to prepare them to handle this kind of crisis, our job as educators is to try to figure out a way how to reach out to the to broader population to explain the importance of science and what science is predicting is actually going to happen. Right, yeah, it's wonderful. The, MIT is aligning its full force behind it. And I sincerely wish that the strides it takes will lead to solutions that can make substantial improvement from where we are today. And, and another, uh, topic of our interest is the, the, the Schwarzman College of Computing. And even under the strains of pandemic, MIT has been moving forward on issues of global importance. So the Schwarzman College of Computing is helping to shape the future of machine learning and AI. What do you see as the role of the college in addressing society's greatest challenges, including climate change and other issues? And, and can you also share some of the recent developments uh, coming out of the college? Yeah, thank you, Sonia. I think uh, the college will have a huge impact um, at MIT in society, and, and I really suspect way beyond MIT. I think the concept is very simple. Um, we, have to, we have to bring uh, data sciences and the technology of machine learning into just about every discipline on campus, into just about any profession on campus, every graduate of MIT will have to learn how to use data sciences, how to use machine learning to practice their profession. It's inevitable. Uh, data is everywhere and we generate data much faster than we know what to do with. And there are many, many solutions embedded in data that if we can mine it, it's there for us to mine it if we just have the right tools. So one way in which it's gonna impact society is having our graduates be very comfortable using machine learning and data sciences to practice their profession. That's number one, the education part. And, 
And goodness, at MIT, there are all those dual majors of, of, of CS and something else, which is really allowing students to graduate in the field that they love, but getting the tools they need to practice there successfully in the disciplines they love. Then the other, the other area which is gonna make a big difference is, is happening already as well as in education is in research. There is so much, so many, do, many domains that again, have a lot of data and, and we don't understand uh, what the science behind what happens. We still don't understand some of that, but the science is embedded in the data, we have it. And if we have the right ways to learn from the data, what is happening, we will be able to under, uh, understand really and create a science that explains it. Uh, we're using in research on campus, we're right? we using machine learning and AI and data sciences and economics. We're using it in urban planning. We're using it in biology. Biology is actually the lowest hanging fruit. We, there is a, so much we don't understand of biology and medicine. But there is plenty of data if we can if we can use as we're doing right now machine learning to see trends in data we will be able to understand and come up with a science of things that we don't understand today so to me those are the biggest opportunities education of people to graduate with the tools they need to practice the profession in the new world and 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 the tools that we use right now for research enhanced augmented by using data sciences and of course, the third element of the college that I think is critical is to teach the societal and ethical responsibilities of how to use these tools. Uh, these tools can be used for good and can be used for bad. And, and we just need to educate uh, our, our, our graduates to understand how to use it the right way, to augment what we do, to make us stronger and better, and not to replace what we do, because that's, that's a destructive approach. So those three legs are part of what I, I, I'm hoping the college will achieve. And I see that each one of them, we already made a lot of progress, even though the college has been with us only for a couple of years. Okay. That's so inspiring. And so, yeah, I, 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 you, you mentioned the college, and, and I think I, I cannot, I know that I'm interrupting a flow, but I really would love to hear your views on, on, on this as well, because you, you have been instrumental, instrumental creating at, at NCSoft AI Center, and, and, and Charlene said that uh, AI Center Natural Languages as well. Uh, 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 for centers. How, how do you see for the company, how do you see in practice uh, uh, how AI and, and machine learning will fit with your vision for where the company is going? Do you mind just sharing your thoughts on that? Sure. Thank you so much for the question. And well, I mean, algorithms and automation have always been an indispensable part of game development from things like churn detection, monetization, level design, design of both monsters and load balancing for supporting 100 player, 100 player raids, AI and machine learning are used extensively by our company. Mm -hmm. So I can only imagine that adoption of technology will grow even more over time and it will be increasingly important for our future. Metaverse is an extension of the game universe and the whole world is built up on computation and algorithms. As the technology advances, our user and player expectation advance in parallel and it forces us to stay at the forefront of the technology development. Um, something good about the game development is that unlike the driverless cars, the worst is it can happen is client crash. So I think it allows us to be more bold in adopting new technologies. But on the other hand, I completely agree with you that the increased adoption of algorithm and machine learning mandate that developers and engineers be more responsible as they choose parameters and the deployed algorithm. And this is why I'm really thrilled by the College of Computing's uh, initiatives, as well as the Embedded Ethics program led by the School of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences. We have to develop strong policies and take responsibility to ensure there is no one who suffers from unintended consequences when using AI and machine learning. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you so much for the question. Uh, uh, now we already have come to the end of our time, I just realized. Um, let's conclude with a question about this fall. What is the first thing you want to do when you go back, go back to campus? <laughs> the first thing I want to do and the first thing I'm going to do 
for walking from where I am right now at Gray House to campus is walk through the infinite corridor. I miss the infinite, it's, it's there, but it's not there without people. Right. Uh, the infinite corridor is the most energetic and energizing place that captures the essence of MIT. It's, it's, it's motivating, it's inspiring. You walk there and you feel the energy and you feel that everything is possible with people around me, with the students and the faculty there. So uh, MIT is not the same without all these people. And the first thing I want to do, and I can't wait for the day that I go back to, from my office there and going through the infinite corridor. That is, that is, I can't wait for that day, Sonia. Right. That's so wonderful. I suddenly miss being back on campus dearly too. And I'm sure many of the audience here share the same. Thank you, President Rai, for guiding us through difficult times and as always help MIT stay on the track as steward of the future to lead in pushing humanity forward through new innovations and solving complex problems. Thank you so much for this time and I always enjoy the opportunity to speak with you. And I hope everyone on this call had a good picture regarding the state of MIT and enjoyed the conversation with President Rife as much as I did. Please stay tuned for the next session, Pathways to the Future of Climate Change. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hey, everybody, we are clear. Thank you very much. Sonia, thank you very much. You were very kind to me. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry I had uh, run a little over time. So, but it was uh, it was such an uh, thank you so much for all your uh, very candid answers and all, all those. And, and I, I I I I did not realize. I mean, I, I had a sense of what you were doing in the company, but I didn't realize uh, it was so much part of what you want. That you need the company to do on the AI and. So I was aware of it, of course, but the kind of company you have, but I didn't realize it was so much into it. So you're driving it beautifully, thank you. I mean, I, I hopefully we'll have more of a chance to uh, to talk about this some more. I mean, you can help us with some thoughts as well, Sonji. Right, yeah, I mean, it has been really fascinating because uh, in, in collaboration with um, Vladimir, uh, I, we realized a lot of technology on campus and researchers can also integrate it into this, like the concept of metaverse and creation of the new virtual world. So um, we talked about that kind of um, that we need, we can we can be an architect in co collecting, uh, bringing all this technology together in in building it, and it has been a very interesting dialogue. Really yeah, and something that I just I just thought of listening to you, and you just said, uh, and you mentioned about Shas and MIT, the School of Humanities and Arts and Social Sciences. They are they are extremely excited by this opportunity to influence how computing is being used, as you probably know by talking to some of them. Uh, and 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 I, and I just when you said that, it just dawned on me that. We're thinking in terms of, of how to use this technology properly, of course, but I didn't realize that we can even come up with games or gaming that at the same time as entertaining, they could actually in a, in a subliminal way teach how to use this technology the right way. It just don't, when you said that, it, it just clicked that maybe you, you thought about that all along. I just didn't realize that until you said it. And, uh, and I'm gonna to talk to my colleagues about that because it's one thing to teach, you know, we're teaching or we have case studies and we're putting into the curriculum and courses about, you know, if you, if you had this problem, how would you solve it? And, and this way is more a destructive way of solving this a more constructive way. I mean, we, we are doing things like that, but, but to think about start teaching kids, which is are the ones who learn uh, uh, this technology faster and they will really use it extensively through games, how to think about this is, is powerful, Sonji. And, and I, I didn't think about it until you said it, actually. I mean, just I was just blown away that I, always makes me mad when somebody else thinks of something I didn't think about it first. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I mean, that, that's, that's absolutely right. And I think that there are, there were some attempt at the media lab in terms of like, uh, using the, the gaming, um, interface in, in delivering some of the messages, but, um, 
I, I'm with you that uh, gaming is the language that this generation understands and kind of they get it like this. So uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's a very powerful tool. And on top of that, I see is the MIT has the strong, uh, the community of the, uh, uh, what is it? I, I just kind of, the, the, the programming language for, for the children. Mm -hmm. It's a strong, I it's a scratch. Scratch, my scratch, scratch, yes. Yeah. It's a strong community, and um, it's it's it has already built a community of kids who understand the gaming language, and it has a, such a great potential that can lead to um, a strong metaverse that you can. Super deliver. powerful, super powerful. Yes, the kids are using Scratch to learn to. They feel powerful because of the things they learn how to do with Scratch and the programs they can build, but but that extra element. Exactly right. Yeah. That I didn't think. You can add it you can, as a yeah. boundary kind of condition. So they have to always think about it and, and um, abide by it to, um, yeah. I mean, there are so many, so many um, interesting opportunities on the campus. And, and I know that you will drive some of them because I remember uh, I, re I, have, I have still at home a, a, a book you gave me for children that I think one of the children <laughs> actually designed so so your mind is into that way of thinking anyway already so right right yeah right yeah that's great so, thank you for everything and thank you thank you for staying connected with us and uh it, it looks like you have to take a vacation from the corporation but hopefully as soon as i can i'll bring you back we need thank you. you thank you yeah it, it was my honor to speak with you this morning thank you for no, having it's, me. It's, it's my it's my delight so yeah I, I i i love to chat with you and i love the way you think <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. i hope you have a great summer thank you you too thank you so much Sonia. be well Bye. Bye -bye. Bye. thanks for joining us and for more information on how to connect with the mit alumni association please visit our website